Hi, I'm Mike Pitcairn with the California Department of Food and Agriculture, and I'd like to talk about biological control as a method of weed control. As gardeners, you have probably seen biological control in action, observing ladybugs feeding on aphids on your roses. Biological control of weeds is very similar, only we use an herbivore, usually insects, that feed on the leaves or the roots or the stem of a plant and cause the abundance of the plant to go down. Many of these exotic plants occur here without their natural enemies. And so biological control scientists travel overseas to the area of origin of these invaded species and look for natural enemies that occur on them there and for those organisms that might be appropriate for transfer and introduction into California. We don't want to bring every natural enemy that we come across into California, just one or two that are, that are probably, hopefully, effective in reducing the abundance of the plants here. And a permit must be obtained from the USDA prior to any release. This limits its use in gardens. Gardeners have to fight dozens of weeds at a time, and a tool that is used against only one weed is not very useful. Also, biological control doesn't eradicate a weed. When we introduce an organism, we, its numbers build up and cause a decline in the target weed's abundance. This decline causes the organism to decline as well, and when the biocontrol agent declines and the weed starts to rebound, this new balance that forms is much lower than the abundance that the weed had prior to introduction. The next thing I'd like to talk about is using animals for control of weeds. And there are several types of animals that are useful uh, in various settings. Geese are very useful for taking out grass weeds, say in an orchard or an area where you had a lot of grass and you often see them congregated along golf courses. Well, geese are natural grass eaters. And so any place where there's grass, they're gonna eat. And what you want is any type of goose that's a baby. The babies eat, sleep, eat, sleep. And so the babies are really your eating machines. When you get the adults, well, they don't work quite as well. It's fight, sex, fight, sex, eat, fight, sex. And so babies, geese really are the best for grass control. The other type of animal that's sometimes useful for brush control, as we see here, are goats. Goats are browsers, and they'll eat practically anything. Spines, thorns, uh, you hear about them eating tin cans. Really, they're not eating the can itself. They're eating the label and the glue off the can. But they are browsers, and they will go through and eat quite a bit of various vegetation. And so they're often used for levy uh, weed control or areas where perhaps herbicides are not uh, the ideal solution, and you want to use a non-chemical method. Goats will work well. Typically, don't buy a goat rent the goat uh, is the way to go and there's a lot of different various sources for renting goats. There are many key points made on biological control of weeds. Biological control is the use of either insects or larger animals to feed or to damage undesirable plants. It oftentimes though, especially with insects, requires permits from USDA. Gardeners and farmers don't generally use biocontrol as they tend to battle many weeds at the same time, and biological control agents tend to be host-specific and only attack a single species. With larger animals, however, you can use biologic control, but primarily in rangeland and wildland areas. For example, goats can be browsers that can effectively control shrubs and can be made to specifically control a single species. My name is Kasim Al-Khatib. I am weed specialist with the University of California. And I will talk today about herbicide used in home garden. There are two groups of herbicides we usually use them in home garden. One we call them non-selective herbicides. These herbicides kill everything green. Things like glyphosate based product in the market, they call them Roundup for example. These are non-selective herbicides that control everything green. The other group of herbicide, we call them selective herbicide. These herbicides kill the weeds, but they don't affect the desired plant. 
So if you put them in your backyard, in the, in the, in the, in the, between your roses or in your flower bed or in your vegetable garden, they will kill the weeds without affecting the desired plant. When you apply herbicide to your backyard, the herbicide may stay in the soil for long or short period of time, and that depends on the herbicide itself. Some of the factors that impact herbicide degradation is sunlight. Other herbicides, they interact with the chemicals in the soil and they break down by a process. We call it chemical degradation. The third way of breaking herbicide in the soil is microbial activity. And in general, when you need a microbial activity, you need also a mild weather and soil moisture that make the microbes more active and break down the herbicide. In environment, when it's dry and cold, usually microbial activity is minimal and you usually don't get a high degradation of herbicide in the soil. Now, what happened to the herbicide when we apply it on the plants? Well, some of that herbicide will land on the plant and absorbed by the plant. The plants that has the ability to break down the herbicide will survive herbicide treatment. Plants that they don't have ability to break the herbicide, they will die. Usually these are the weeds. Now part of the herbicide also will land on the soil surface. So what happened to that herbicide? Well, some of it will leach in the soil profile when we irrigate the soil. You know, that herbicide can move a few inches or can move more than a few inches reaching the groundwater. The other way the herbicide can move from that area of application is by blowing soil dust or by soil particle moving with the, with the runoff, water runoff. Then the other way the herbicide can be lost from the soil is by volatility. Some herbicides got high vapor pressure and with the sunlight, they can we can lose them to the environment as a vapor. And when they move as a vapor, you need to be careful because what's the plant next to you may be affected by the vapor move from your home garden to your neighbor or even to your own plants. As we've discussed earlier, there are two types of herbicides that are commonly used in home gardens. There are non-selective herbicides that control everything and selective herbicides that target specific plant groups. Soil applied herbicides can remain in the soil either a very short time or a very long time depending upon the compound and the climatic conditions. Herbicides generally last longer in the soil under dry and cold conditions compared to wet warmer conditions. In soils, herbicides can be broken down by three mechanisms, light, chemical reactions, and most commonly by microbes. Herbicides can also move in soil depending upon the compound and the amount of irrigation or rainfall. Herbicides can move down in the soil profile by leaching. This is usually with water. But they can also move laterally off-site either in soil or with water when too much water is applied. A few herbicides can move into the atmosphere through vaporization loss, which is much more common on very hot days. However, for selective herbicides, most desirable plants degrade the herbicide before it can damage the plant, whereas susceptible plants are incapable of breaking it down quickly and thus they are killed. We've discussed what happens to herbicides in the environment, and now we're gonna spend some time talking about different formulations of herbicides and how to calibrate herbicides. If you overapply an herbicide, you can either kill a desirable plant that you're not trying to kill, or you can create an environmental problem by adding too much herbicide to a landscape that can then wash off uh, turf or other types of areas into the water or into uh, other areas that are not target areas. Now herbicides can be formulated three different ways. One is a liquid and that is they just dissolve uh, in water readily. Uh, sugar and salt would be examples of products that would be easily uh, liquid formulation, easily dissolve in water. A second type of formulation is an emulsifiable concentrate. Now these you also mix with water, but when you do they turn cloudy. And an example of a homeowner product that would be an emulsifiable concentrate would be uh, milk. So those types of products you just simply add water to and we're gonna talk about how you calibrate them. 
The third type of formulation is the granular formulation, and you're going to hear more about this later on. But granular formulations are not mixed with water. They're applied as granules directly to landscape, typically to turf. I'm John Roncaroni, Cooperative Extension Weed Science Farm Advisor in Napa County. Wheat and feeds allow you to combine two lawn operations into one. They allow you to fertilize your lawn while also getting weed control. You must remember, though, that there are two basic types of weed and feed. When applying the pre-emergent herbicide, you must apply before the weeds emerge. Either in late winter or early spring, or in late fall or early winter. With the post-emergent weed and feed, it's, Im it's important that you apply this when the weeds have emerged but are small. It's also important that the leaves of the broadleaf weeds be wet, slightly wet or damp so that this post-emergent herbicide can stick to the weeds and kill them. Remember, weed and feed used properly will not only fertilize your lawn but provide you with excellent weed control. In this section on formulation, we learn that there are two basic types of herbicides, pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicides. Pre-emergents are applied before weeds come up and post-emergent are applied to weeds that have already emerged through the soil. Herbicides can be formulated in three different ways as liquids, emulsifiable concentrates, and as solid granular or pelleted forms. Sometimes herbicides can be added to fertilizers in weed and feeds. And these products not only fertilize the grasses, but also provide weed control of species that are soon to germinate, in particular crabgrass.